What have we learned in the week since the Beirut explosion about what really happened? Let's dive deep into some of the detail. My name is Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. In the days that have followed the terrible explosion in the port of Beirut, people have been trying to piece things back together and to work out how they can move forwards. One of the inspiring things has been to see all the footage of Beirut citizens, particularly the youth of Beirut, coming together to clear up the debris and the mess. At the same time, unsurprisingly, there has been rising anger against the authorities because whichever version of exactly what happened to cause this explosion, you decide to believe there's absolutely no version where those people come out looking good. So there have been protests. Very quickly, the government resigned en masse. But that doesn't satisfy anybody because it's the whole rotten, corrupt system that people want removed, not just the names of those who get to administer it. Because behind the scenes, the same people, many refer to them as gangsters, are still in charge. The mood was given voice by the father of Alexandra Nadja, a three-year-old girl who was killed in the family's home by the impact of the explosion. In a television interview, he spoke to the political classes specifically, and he said this, You are all criminals. You killed us in our homes, the place where I thought I could keep my family safe. He said that the blast hadn't killed Christians, Muslims, or members of this party or that, just Lebanese. And now the Lebanese had to unite to overthrow the old corrupt system. It's a sentiment shared by many, and for some it's a sentiment given immediacy by widely shared assumptions about where the blame lies for the recent disaster. So, let's go back to what actually happened. Because as time has passed, more wild conspiracy theories have been flying around, as has genuine confusion. In my first video on this, I was looking at what we knew, and I said I was about 50-50 between one, this has been a random accident with material stored long past when it should have been dealt with, and two, that this was a Hezbollah weapons store, which probably by accident, maybe by a military strike, exploded. And then in the second most recent video, I said I'd edge to 60-40 in favour of the Hezbollah store theory. More details and claims have emerged, and with various groups now with incentives to cover their backs, we may now know as much as we are ever going to. There are key questions to be answered. One, was Hangar 12 and or the adjacent hangar under the control of Hezbollah, with the implication that they were using or intended to use the ammonium nitrate for weapons? And with the additional implication, there may have been other munitions stored there, not necessarily fireworks, as have been claimed. Was it accident that brought the ammonium nitrate to Beirut, or was it by design? What set it all off in the first place? What caused the accident? And then, of course, there's a the small matter of what happens next. OK, on the first question, there are multiple sources that state that it was well known that Hezbollah had significant influence or control of the port. So, for instance, the Atlantic Council said in a blog post that suspicions that Hezbollah controlled the ammonium nitrate weren't entirely groundless because the group is known to exercise a degree of control over Beirut's port. The National Review said, Moreover, according to local knowledge, Hezbollah was blocking and controlling access to the area where the AN, the ammonium nitrate, was stored. The Brookings Institute offered the following analysis. Hezbollah's interest in the port has primarily been linked to its economic network, perhaps including drugs more than its arms smuggling. Hezbollah's economic tentacles are widespread and extend to Africa and Latin America, used car smuggling, independent telecom and internet networks, and so forth. By having effective control of or dominance in Lebanon's ports, Hezbollah masks its activities and avoids paying customs and taxes, mafia-like behaviour of less concern to Israel than precision-guided missiles. Israel blockaded but did not destroy Lebanon's ports in 2020. Dr Mordecai Kassar, who I mentioned before as having had 25 years' experience with Israeli intelligence, now retired, suggested this. After Israel, according to foreign sources, attacked the warehouses at Damascus Airport several times, Beirut Seaport replaced Damascus Airport as the destination for Hezbollah's ammunition and explosives imports from Iran. What used to arrive at Damascus Airport by air is now brought to Beirut by ship. 
for Hezbollah's purposes, the warehouses at the port of Beirut have replaced the warehouses of Damascus Airport. In a separate article, Qadar was quoted as saying, there have been many videos of Hezbollah officials bragging about their Fatima Gate, which is a nickname given their independent clandestine port structure in Beirut, completely out of control and visibility of the Lebanese government. Elsewhere in the same article, the American Center for Policy Studies said this, Lebanese are universal in their belief that Hezbollah rules the critical areas of the port as a government within a government. And then later said specifically, Lebanese port workers themselves regarded Hangar 12 as an off-limits Hezbollah zone. It's worth noting that although, as you can see, there were multiple sources saying Hezbollah's influence was strong at the port, that was the only one I've seen that specifically suggests that Hangar 12 was well known as controlled by them. Although the National Review piece sort of implies it without saying it. There's no supporting evidence for that statement, or indeed for any of the statements. And there's always the danger that the everyone knew this type statements end up with multiple writers taking their belief from a single source, therefore amplifying it into received wisdom. So the fact there are multiple articles making this claim doesn't prove it was true when no evidence is quoted. At least one sceptic journalist, whose writing supports Iran and Hezbollah positions, has scoffed at the idea of the port having major Hezbollah influence at all. Elijah Magnier argued that since the parts of Beirut surrounding the port were people not generally friendly to Hezbollah, speculation about Hezbollah storing weapons at Warehouse 12 is ridiculous and unfounded because the place was under constant surveillance by cameras controlled by the security forces themselves. Hezbollah would certainly not store weapons in an area both unfriendly and not under its own control. It doesn't sound an especially credible argument because these are not gated communities and Hezbollah influence with the government means you wouldn't expect it simply to be unable to operate in certain places and especially an area of such high strategic importance as a port. If those hangars were under constant surveillance by cameras then how come no footage has emerged from those cameras of this incident? It's all come from individuals shot on their phones. Indeed, Mordecai Kadar's statement, which I covered last time, said that those hangars, being close to the water, were ideal because they were the sort of places you could move stuff around and precisely not be seen. And the real proof of that, I suppose, is that within an hour of the explosion at the port, it was Hezbollah who first issued a statement giving information about the material that had blown up. If they'd had no presence and no influence at the port, then why would it be them that made the first statement? Hezbollah leader Nasrallah says that there were no weapons at the ports, but people are taking that with a massive pinch of salt. The US government certainly didn't believe it in the recent past. It recently designated for sanctions Wafik Safa, who it described as Hezbollah interlocutor to the Lebanese security forces. As head of Hezbollah's security apparatus, which is directly linked to Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah, Safa has exploited Lebanon's ports and border crossings to smuggle contraband and facilitate travel on behalf of Hezbollah. So from all of that, it does seem likely that Hezbollah had influence and some degree of control at the port of Beirut. It's less well established it covered Hangar 12 specifically. Second, there is a strong history of Hezbollah using and stockpiling explosives grade ammonium nitrate. So, for example, a Hezbollah agent was sentenced in Cyprus in 2015 after he pleaded guilty for the seizure of nine tonnes of ammonium nitrate with the intention of carrying out terrorist attacks in Cyprus against Israeli interests. Also, Hezbollah stores of ammonium nitrate have been uncovered by German security forces and also by the UK. So it's pretty indisputable that the use of this stuff is standard Hezbollah modus operandi. Third, the ammonium nitrate stored in Beirut has been confirmed as having been of explosives grade, not the lower grade, more suited as a fertiliser. This is both suggested by the nitroprol brand name on the pictures taken on the material in Hangar 12. That brand name is indeed explosives grade material, but also according to the documentation for the ship carrying it, the Rosas, which said the shipment was going to Fabrica de Explosivos de Mozambique, an explosives company. 
It's also been stated by a retired inspector of Beirut Port who was interviewed by Lebanese journalist Marcel Ghanem on MTV, who said a number of things, but one of which was that tests on the cargo showed that it was the highest explosives grade. Fourth, whether correct or not, a story has started to solidify about how this shipment was actually always intended to get to Hezbollah. This is the story as it's circulating amongst many Lebanese at the moment via WhatsApp. A dummy company operating out of Mozambique buys 2,700 tonnes of ammonium nitrate from the black market in Russia. It uses a bankrupt Russian businessman and fugitive living in Cyprus, Igor Greshchuskin, and pays him reportedly a million dollars to transport the shipment. A retired and bankrupt Russian captain, Boris Prokoshev, is brought in to captain the ship. During the trip, Prokoshev is instructed to pick something up at Beirut on the way, which he does. As he gets ready to leave, he is stopped by the port's administration that demands he pays fines and docking fees. He can't do that. He hasn't been paid for months and his crew have to beg for food to be brought on board while they are being held. The port confiscates the shipment and no company in Mozambique is ever seen asking about the whereabouts of this large quantity of valuable material or indeed what happened to the ship. Nobody has been able to reach that company and the file is then closed and then the circulated version added another comment which made another telling observation. After this fact, you are able to freely transport as much ammonium nitrate as you please from the port to Syria, Iraq and Yemen without anyone bothering you. Which implies that rather than just being a load that gets dumped into a hangar and left there, actually it was a cover for an active importing and distributing operation. Which kind of makes more sense than the idea that someone just dumped all of this stuff in a hangar and left it there. Doesn't it? But that last bit is speculation, and the photos that have emerged of huge sacks stored in a warehouse certainly have all the look of neglect about them. It could be that having arrived, Hezbollah was content if it was simply kept in place as a store that they could dip into now and then when they needed to. All of that is speculation, obviously. It appeals because it has logic. It fits the scenario without any mind-bending conspiracy theorist leaps of imagination. Here's one piece of actual supporting circumstantial evidence. According to the managing company of the port of Beira in Mozambique, which is where the Rosas was headed, they had never been notified of a ship containing 2,750 tonnes of ammonium nitrate. Antonio Libombo, deputy executive director of the company, said, Normally, before receiving a ship, we are notified. In this case, we never received any notification from a ship coming to the port of Beira with these characteristics and cargo. The Mozambican Ministry of Transport and Communications also said it hadn't been informed about such a vessel for that year. And one more piece of potential supporting evidence. According to one expert, the size of the blast actually implies a smaller quantity of ammonium nitrate than that was, that was stated to be stored at the hangar. According to the Russian Viktor Murakovsky, the quantity involved had to be significantly less than the amount stated, otherwise the blast would have flattened the capital and killed many more people. If true, that would be compatible with a suggestion that it wasn't just stored there, but it was being sent out to other locations for use, or that it had been stored, but there'd been quite a bit of pilfering over the last few years. However, this is a detail that experts aren't agreed on because elsewhere it's stated that explosives experts believe that the size of a blast is exactly compatible with the stated quantity of the material. What does that tell you? It tells you that, as always, the opinions of experts vary. You should treat them as interesting inputs, not conclusive proof. Reuters tried to work its way along the paper trail of his shipment, trying to find out who actually owned it, and came up with some additional details. It was allegedly manufactured by a Georgian fertiliser maker, Rustavi Azot, as we've established, this was explosives grade. So that description of a company somewhat questionable, you know, a Russian front company, maybe. 
Uh, it was dissolved in 2016, so we'll probably never know for sure. The Mozambique firm that ordered the ammonium nitrate, Fabrica de Explosivas Mozambique, FEM, FEM, has said that yes, it did so, but it only agreed to pay on delivery, so it wasn't the legal owner at the time it went off course. The question therefore remains who did pay for it? The cargo was worth around $700,000 at 2013 prices. FEM said it ordered the material through a trading firm, Savaro Limited, whose website is now offline. Reuters visited the company's listed London address and found a Victorian terraced house, not a company building, and nobody was home. They did track down a Savaro Limited director, Greta Bielien, a Lithuanian based in Cyprus. She refused to answer questions. Reuters said that a source familiar with the inner workings of Savaro's trading business, you have to take the validity of that source with some degree of trust, of course, said that the company sold fertiliser from ex-Soviet states to clients in Africa. Now, interestingly, the Rosas actually got stopped even before it got to Beirut. It was detained for 13 days by port authorities in Seville, Spain. They found the ship was in a bad state. So how come it was allowed to leave after 13 days? It was inspected by a firm called Maritime Lloyd, which issued a cargo ship safety certificate. Reuters says that Maritime Lloyd, quote, does not rank amongst the most prominent and widely used inspection firms, and said that an inspector there that they spoke to couldn't confirm whether or not it actually had provided such documents to officials in Seville in that instance. The ship was chartered by the Russian Grachushkin via his shipping firm Tato Shipping. It was Grachushkin who took the captain and the crew on, failed to pay them for four months, make it impossible for them to pay the fines and fees in Beirut, and then abandon the ship and the cargo without dispute. Which you don't generally do if you expect to be paid a good percentage on a $700,000 shipment, unless you already have been, of course. And that's what people suggest, that Hezbollah is the missing paymaster. What we have for sure is a list of players and incidents that don't add up. What we don't have is a definitive link that Hezbollah was involved from the start. One claim I hadn't absorbed before, which is that both Hangar 9 and Hangar 12 were said by some reports to have been involved, with the initial fire and flashes that could have been munitions or could have been fireworks coming from Hangar 9, which then, when the second quite big explosion took place, carried the impact over to Hangar 12, where the ammonium nitrate lived. This was suggested by the Centre for Security Policy, which argued that the events visible in the videos suggested high explosives and rocket fuel in Hangar 9, not necessarily fireworks. After the second explosion, the roof of the hangar had been at least partially blown off because the white flashes could be seen above the hangar. And it argued that had these been fireworks, you would have seen streamers and sparkling explosions going in all directions. The implication, therefore, was that Hangar 9 was a Hezbollah weapons store, which is why the fire took hold there first and Hangar 12 was just the ammonium nitrate. Blogger Tikan Olam also argued this in support of his proposition, without specific evidence, that the explosion had been caused by an attack by Israel. Israel targeted a Hezbollah weapons depot at the port and planned to destroy it with an explosive device. Tragically, Israeli intelligence did not perform due diligence on its target, thus they did not know that there were 2,700 tonnes of ammonium nitrate stored in a next-door warehouse. The explosion at the arms depot ignited the fertiliser, causing the catastrophe that resulted. There was other supporting logic. For one thing, the strength of the second explosion was stronger than you would have gotten from fireworks. Secondly, an Italian explosives expert named Danilo Kopp said that the red smoke seen after the main explosion was deep red, which suggested the presence of lithium, such as you would find in rocket fuel. So that's for contention. Hangars 9 and 12 were or were part of Hezbollah's so-called Fatima Gate. The shipment was a cover, and it has legitimised the port's use for moving explosives around ever since. All of that sounds quite compelling, doesn't it? Which is exactly why you have to be really careful not to simply conclude that's it, case closed, and then close your mind to any other evidence or any other explanations. Two key pieces of evidence present themselves. One is the idea that the fire started with Hangar 9, and this was where the munitions were. 
It actually doesn't seem to fit the best video evidence that has emerged. This video, for instance, was shot from the earliest point we have any footage, well before even the second explosion. And clearly, even at that early stage, it is Hangar 12 that is on fire. In this other video, shot from the top of the grain silos, there's clearly lots of mini explosions going on inside this hangar, not the next door one. The explosion you get at the end of this is the second one, not the final one, by the way. The second key piece of evidence is this. In the last few days, investigators have stated that they found evidence of fireworks, along with paint thinner and other flammable material. And they say they found no evidence of munitions. A piece in the Washington Post said this, Investigations are not yet complete, but accounts of port workers suggest that hazardous materials were stored together inside Warehouse 12, said Lieutenant Michel Elmer, head of search and rescue for the Lebanese fire crew at the port. Vapour from paint thinners can ignite in the air and cause fires in unventilated hot conditions. Fuel may also have been stored there. Murr said teams searching the site had also found evidence of fireworks and hydrocarbons, but there was no sign of munitions. Businessmen with knowledge of the port confirmed that the warehouse was specifically used for storing hazardous flammable materials. Some paint thinners are known to have a flashpoint of around 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperatures in Beirut on the fatal day were 90 degrees and almost certainly significantly hotter in an uncooled metal warehouse. A French search and rescue team said that the warehouse was used for other chemicals and flammables, but that it is still unknown if they started the fire that triggered the explosion that killed at least 171 people. That pushes us back towards the idea that this was indeed a store that had been managed incompetently. You can understand why it's logical to store all flammable materials together in one place, but obviously not when you have a vast quantity of ammonium nitrate sitting in the same place. This is at least an explanation that now we know about the chemicals, such as the paint thinner, we do have some plausible theory for how the thing got started. So, is that case closed? Maybe. But we're now in a stage of everyone covering their back, so it's a legitimate question to ask whether the evidence has been tampered with, whether people have an incentive not to be wholly frank, or what. The French are trying to broker a deal that will see Lebanon move forward. It's not beyond the bounds of possibility that they've offered Hezbollah a deal that says back away from day-to-day -day involvement in the government here and we will support your cover story, but it wasn't your store and therefore retain the shreds of your reputation with the people. Sometimes that's how pragmatic realpolitik is done. Remember, the Lebanese government refused to allow a formal international inquiry, which people take as highly suggestive that there are things to cover up. In the last couple of days, Lebanese President Michel Aoun, who is not resigning, said that the national inquiry into the explosion was complex saying it won't be able to be finished very quickly as we wished it to. We shouldn't therefore accept too much on face value for statements that come out in the subsequent period about what has or has not been discovered on the ground. So, where does that leave us? A large part of the population of Beirut assumes that Hezbollah was at least in part responsible for this material, and I have to say that's backed up by significant circumstantial evidence but not proof. I find the evidence of the irregular nature of the shipment and the lack of energy on the part of its alleged owner to recover it. Somewhat persuasive that it was brought to Beirut because Hezbollah organised it that way. And while it doesn't look very likely that it's been a high volume site with material coming and going under the cover of that shipment, still it seems likely that Hezbollah might have been resisting attempts to have the store relocated as they used it as a convenient place to dip into. It's an open question whether Hangar 9 had other weapons. It seems there's now evidence of the presence of fireworks, but I am looking for a definitive conclusion on that from a source I can trust. Groups that are desperate not to be blamed have an incentive to cover up, and I have no information as to how feasible that is, because even the highly motivated can't cover up what's buried under tons of rubble. Not easily, anyway. In other words, we've had a week and a half more time and evidence and we're still speculating. That said, with the concrete evidence of Hezbollah's fondness for using ammonium nitrate, 
I can't quite get my head into holy thinking. It's long-term sighting at the port where multiple people are tested to their influence is a pure coincidence. So on that score, I say my 60% inclination from the last video has nudged to 70%. And now it seems likely to stay unless something drastic happens to fill in the gaps. Because the attention now moves towards how the spirit of those cleaning up the city can be rewarded by some sort of political change so that they can have a representative, functional, non-corrupt government. At the time of shooting this, Lebanon is about to learn the outcome into an international inquiry into the assassination of the former Prime Minister Rafik Hariri. It's expected it will confirm that four Hezbollah operatives were responsible. Before this explosion, such a result was going to create added energy and momentum in the call for reform. Now, uh, it's probably all but redundant, because nobody needs more of a spur for change than what Beirut has now seen already.